case of Whitney versus Mucker at all, each party will have 15 minutes to present their argument. The appellant may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. The appellant would like to reserve time for rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor. How long? Four minutes, please. All right. Um, what we'll note then, basically, if you're looking at the clock where we're keeping time up there to your left, uh, when that gets down to four minutes left, that will be when you're into your rebuttal time, okay? Thank you. Uh, no problem at all. Also, uh, during your argument, you should not refer to any victims or children or folks. I know this case has some sensitive matters involved in it. If you're using initials for parties, we under for individuals, we understand that we're some form of a, a defined term. Uh, that would be helpful as well if you're doing that. We understand your attempt to do that. There are, there are no minors involved in the I, I said that. Right? I, I said that part of it. I know there's some allegations here. The matter was um, sealed at the trial court level, so to the extent that there's some concerns about that as you're addressing our the judges have read your briefs and are ready to proceed whenever you are. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Shannon Polk, and together with uh, my co-counsel Tim Cannon, we represent Jennifer Whitney. Jen Whitney's case is that she was fired for raising concerns about unlawful practices and retaliation against Jeanette Knudsen and her compliance department. Smucker's defense is that those complaints had nothing to do with the termination, but rather Whitney was fired because Jones Day said that she had concealed a document, the IS summary. In granting summary judgment, the trial court erred by failing to evaluate the entire record and failing to construe facts in Whitney's favor. Smucker even acknowledges that the trial court erred, but what they label as harmless is anything but. For example, the trial court stated that, quote, Whitney claims she told Mark Smucker compliance had engaged in unlawful investigatory tactics. But on the very same page, the trial court states that it, quote, can't assume or infer that Mark Smucker knew Whitney had complained of invest unlawful investigatory tactics. And at the initial paragraph of her opinion, the trial court readily acknowledged that Jones Day role in this case was as an independent investigator, not as counsel. Yet, the trial court permitted Smucker to selectively shield their communications with and about Jones Day during the course of discovery, resulting in Smucker's ability to self-servingly selectively disclose their own privileged information while hiding the same on the same subjects at summary judgment. Let's start with the premise of Smucker's defense and their sword and shield litigation strategy. That privilege somehow extends to Jones Day as outside counsel. They know that's not true. Jones Day was acting as independent investigators, not legal advocates. It was described by Smucker's own in-house lawyer as a basic employment law concept that if you're accused of something uh, in the way of unlawful behavior, you can hire an independent investigator and point to their report as part of your defense that you did nothing wrong. But when you do that, everything the independent investigator receives, reviews, and considers is discoverable. From the start, Smucker planned to use Jones Day in exactly this way, point to its report as a defense. Smucker's own outside counsel from Baker Hosteller, Amy Traub, testified that using Jones Day in this role implicated concerns over privilege waiver. Now move on to the idea that Whitney somehow concealed the IS summary from Jones Day. They know that's not true as well. The IS summary was actually created at the direction of Baker Hostetler's Amy Trout when she was handling the Kasson matter as outside counsel for the company in 2019. Whitney made Jeanette Knudsen and Pen Jill Penrose aware of the IS summary in the fall of 2019. In June of 2020, Jen Whitney advised Jones Day that she had, quote, documents created for outside counsel regarding Kasson over which she had privilege concerns. And on July 16th of 2020, Amy Traub of Baker Hosteller with Jen Whitney, together on the phone with Jones Day and Jeanette Knudsen, advised that if the IS summary itself was, dis uh, was uh, uh, given to Jones Day, there would be waiver of privilege concerns. That's why Amy Traub, following that call, was appointed to be the point person to handle the passage of information from Smucker people to Jones Day. Consistent with that protocol, after that phone call, Jen Whitney sent the IS summary to Amy Traub and discussed if it was producible. And Amy Traub admitted at deposition that she talked with Jones Day about the IS summary after Whitney sent it to her, 
but Smucker selectively invoked privilege to stop her from disclosing any more about the substance of those communications in discovery. Smucker tries to insulate itself in this case by pointing to Jones Day, the idea that they're not responsible for errors or flaws or failures because Jones Day reported it in their document called the ER Specific Summary. That's not so. That document is in and of itself the very definition of pretext. The ER Specific Summary stated that there were no privilege concerns if the IS summary was given to Jones Day. However, it was written after Amy Traub advised Jones Day and Knudsen that there were in fact waiver concerns if the IS summary was given to Jones Day. And it was written after Jeanette Knudsen admits she knew waiver was in fact an issue if privileged materials were given to Jones Day. The ER specific summary also implies that the IS summary was somehow withheld, but leaves out the fact that Whitney told Jones Day she had privileged notes and memos related to its investigation, leaves out the fact that Knudsen and Penrose were both aware of the document as early as 2019, leaves out the fact that Amy Traub discussed it with Jeanette Knudsen and Jones Day, leaves out the fact that Jen Whitney provided it to Traub per the protocol with Jones Day involved in that protocol, and leaves out the fact that Mark Smucker was told by uh, Jill Penrose and uh, that Jill Penrose told Mark Smucker and Jeanette Knudsen that Whitney had no motive to withhold the document because it was previously disclosed to her being Penrose and Jeanette Knudsen in 2019. And the creation of the ER specific summary also screams pretext. Jeanette Knudsen requested Jones Day to prepare it. And it's after Jen Whitney and Jill Penrose raised concerns with Knudsen about unlawful behaviors and retaliation. And it's after Knudsen admitted she had a conflict of interest related to issues involving Jen Whitney and ER. And it's after Jeanette Knudsen acknowledged the existence of a, quote, claim of retaliation against an individual in compliance. Jeanette Knudsen also was allowed to review and comment on drafts of that document after she, would admit, she admits she was conflicted out. Smucker can't deflect by pointing to Jones Day for reporting it to them when it conflicted out by her own admission, Jeanette Knudsen was involved in its creation. As to Mark Smucker's involvement, Mark Smucker told Jen Whitney she was being terminated based upon the friction with Jeanette Knudsen's compliance department. Mark Smucker knew about Jen Whitney's claims. Jill Penrose briefed Mark Smucker on the ongoing challenges involving Whitney and Knudsen's compliance department. Jill Penrose advised Mark Smucker about the, quote, claims against Knudsen's compliance department. Jen Whitney herself expressly identified herself as a reporter with Mark Smucker and detailed to Mark Smucker concerns about, quote, unlawful investigatory practices and retaliation by Jeanette Knudsen and the compliance department. Mark Belgia, who was with Mark Smucker as Jen Whitney was expressly identifying herself as a reporter, admitted that in doing so, Whitney was, quote, raising her hand about legal risk, vulnerabilities on employment law issues. Mark Smucker and Penrose also, as this was taking place, privately observed in a text string that Jeanette Knudsen was not in a good place, quote, upset, and quote, pissed off. Mark Smucker went so far as to admit at deposition that he fired Jen Whitney because Jeanette Knudsen would be, quote, mad if he did not. As well, the two highest ranking human resource officers of the Smucker Company took the time to discuss the rationale for the termination with Mark Smucker, pushed back on his rationale, and were so involved in the termination decision that they drafted his talking points to sit and terminate Jen Whitney. They confirmed Jen Whitney's claims. Jill Penrose testified that Jeanette Knudsen wanted Jen Whitney fired. She also told Jen Whitney that her termination was, quote, retaliatory, that the reasons were, quote, nonsense, and that Jen Whitney should consider filing a lawsuit. Jill Penrose also praised Jen Whitney for, quote, having the courage to stand up and speak out against unlawful workplace behaviors, even knowing what the outcome would be. Lindsay Tomaszewski, for her part, also the head, a, a, a corporate officer and involved in human resources, testified that Jeanette Knudsen was trying to influence the decision to terminate Jen Whitney and challenged Mark Smucker as an officer of the company expressly so, and indicated that Jen Whitney's firing, in her opinion, was not in the company's best interest, 
and she questioned, as a human resource official, how the company could, quote, legitimately explain the decision. Based upon this evidence alone, construed in Jen Whitney's favor, not the other way around, summary judgment should be reversed. As to the remaining issues on appeal, Smucker voluntarily disclosed its own privileged information, while at the same time withholding privileged information on the exact same subject. We raised this issue with the trial court. It denied our motion, which emboldened Smucker to selectively disclose its own privileged information once again. In moving for, the, for summary judgment, Smucker then took its selective privileged information, filed it affirmatively, pointed to it, and relied upon it, consistent with the arguments for the request of information we had made in our motion to compel before the trial court. The trial court granted summary judgment, cited to the selectively disclosed information that Smucker chose to reveal in its order. And next, the trial court sealed its summary judgment opinion after publishing it publicly for a week at Smucker's request without doing any of the analysis required by the Ohio Supreme Court. And now, as a, a natural result of Smucker's own chosen litigation strategy, we are here discussing in open court the supposedly privileged information that Smucker selectively chose to disclose when they, sought it was helpful, when they thought it was helpful to them, while at the same time, Jen Whitney has been denied the benefit of supposedly privileged information on the exact same subjects that Smucker selectively chose to hide and not disclose when it didn't suit them. Litigants aren't permitted to do that. That's inconsistent with Ohio uh, statutory and common law. The trial, the trial court summary judgment opinion should be unsealed, as well as all the evidentiary materials that went into that decision. And this court should be remanded with a finding that because Smucker waived its privilege, all of the information previously withheld on privileged grounds must be produced to Jen Whitney prior to trial. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Weimer, Baker Hostetler, with my co-counsel Carrie Valdez, also Baker Hostetler. It's our privilege to represent the J.M. Smucker Company and its CEO, Mark Smucker. It's a fundamental principle of appellate jurisprudence. You can't raise an argument for the first time in your appellate argument. I think, uh, I believe it's Judge Hensel in the recent Gorby case reaffirmed that principle. This is the first time, and I've been in this case from the beginning, that I've heard the argument that because Jones Day, a world-renowned law firm, <coughs> was hired to do an investigation, and that the board wanted it to be an independent investigation, therefore, you cannot assert privilege for anything Jones Day, and for its discussions with the general counsel about legal issues related to the investigation. They didn't argue it before the trial court, and the uh, discovery order they're, the discovery order they're appealing is dated 12-30-21. Uh, they didn't argue it, argue it, and we had extensive briefing. Their motion to compel is 93 pages. They filed a reply brief. They filed a notice of recent authority. I think there were six briefs filed before the court issued that 12-30-21 decision. The argument was not made that privilege doesn't apply because Jones Day was a law firm doing an, in, an independent investigation. It wasn't referred to in their briefs at this court. So this is the first time they've made it. That obviously, there's no case law support for that argument, but they, they've never raised it until 15 minutes ago. Second, they know Amy Trott did not say her deposition, did not identify the IS summary and, and the July 16th. Um, all she said was she was talking about sending it to Jones Day on September 2nd, months after Jones Day had it. We objected to her, to her discussion with Jones Day about the document at that time. He said, did you ever mention, or, 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 or was the, were these things, and I encourage the court to look, it's TD 131 at 28 to 29, it's Trump's uh, deposition that they cite. It's a very convoluted question about work, about potential waiver of work product. And they said, did you ever discuss these after some objections and back and forth? 
said, did you ever discuss these things with Jones Day? And Amy Traub said, in some form, during the July 16th call. Then in an errata sheet, which I think it's disingenuous to cite that testimony and not the errata sheet um, explaining that in some form, as the court knows, is the law is you consider the errata sheet along with the testimony. She said, when I said in some form, I was talking about waiver concerns. Of course I didn't mention the IS summary because it wasn't sent to me until 11 days later. The evidence is undisputed that Traub didn't even get the IS summary until July 27. And in fact, Whitney admitted that in her deposition, Exhibit 16 of her deposition, um, is, is an email she sent to Knudsen on August 27th saying, I only recently discovered this IS summary in my drafts file and sent it to Amy. Um, so the evidence is undisputed. Traub didn't even have the IS summary until 11 days later. I'm not sure it matters. The issue is not what Amy Traub, my law partner at Baker Hostetler, may have said on a call on July 16th. Did Mark Smucker know any of this? He gets the findings from Jones Day, both in the ER summary and in the PowerPoint. No evidence Newton even commented at all on the PowerPoint, which said that ER didn't produce a document. They, they claimed they were concerned about waiver. Jones Day doesn't see the waiver problem with sharing uh, allegedly privileged document with your own, their, your own attorneys. And we think if she would have given us the document, the investigation would have been uh, a lot more efficient, wouldn't have taken us. That's what uh, Smucker was, was told. In any event, um, this sword and shield strategy, I know it's a catchy phrase, and they lifted it in the Squire Sanders case a few years ago, but it's apples and oranges. What's it was issued at the 1230 order, the order they're appealing, is could we keep, could, um, could they, did we need to publicize, did we need to produce documents that was on our privilege law? We never selectively cited those documents in summary judgment. They are still on our privilege log and have never been discussed. The communications between Knudsen and, and, and Jones Day, a legal memo Traub sent to Knudsen, all the documents on our privilege log remain unpublished, undisclosed to this very day. So in their waiver argument, they're mixing apples and oranges. They're bringing up arguments they made at the motion and limine stage, which was being briefed when the court issued summary judgment. They never, there's no issue of withheld communications later being disclosed at summary judgment. That's just patently untrue. Now, I'd like to speak for a moment about the lay opinion hearsay issue because the, uh, my, my, my colleague, Mr. Polk, a fine lawyer, he did not uh, address this, but I'd like to take a moment uh, here. They relied heavily on their briefs for both assignment of error number one, the direct evidence issue, and assignment of error number two, the uh, uh, indirect method of proof issue. They relied on Whitney's testimony. She claims that Jill Penrose told her a couple of days after the, um, you know, after the uh, termination that the termination was retaliatory, and she, I think she said, I believe she even used the word pretext. Well, that's inadmissible legal conclusions under both 701 and the hearsay rule 801. Um, as the court knows, under rule 701, for a lay opinion testimony to be admissible, it must be based on the rational perception of a witness and helpful to understanding fact and issue of the witness's testimony. The common thread, as this court said in, Johnson, in, 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 Ewing, uh, in the Ewing case, was it must be based on the own observa the, the, uh, observations of the witness, citing State versus Johnson, the Ohio Supreme Court case. It can't be based on the investigation or observations of others. Jones Day did an investigation, Mark Smucker did an investigation, Joe Penrose didn't do an investigation. And they introduced no evidence as to what Mark Smucker told Joe Penrose um, as to why he terminated Whitney. All Joe testified to says it had to do with the Jones Day report. What do they cite as the personal observations of Jill Penrose? 
She was an officer. She talked to Mark Smucker about the termination. And she wrote a memo dated 9-13-20 in which she uh, contested the termination. But that memo doesn't reveal what Mark told her. They deployed Joe Penrose for eight hours. They didn't ask her, did Mark explain the basis of his decision? Did he tell you why, why, why he made the decision? They didn't ask Mark Smucker. So there's no evidence to support the notion that Joe Penrose had the found, and they didn't lay the foundation to be able to say that it was retaliatory or a pretext. As the court also knows, under 701 and 801, legal conclusions are not admissible because they're not based on personal observations. That's the common thread. The Marietta College case is a good case for that that we cited in our briefs where a senior employee of the, of the college said rape, the rape of the victim was foreseeable because the stairs were dimly lit. There had been a, a high crime area et cetera, et cetera. The court says, you can say all those things. You can't say it was foreseeable. That's a legal conclusion. The Becton versus Starbucks case, the manager could say it didn't look like the lid was on properly, but he couldn't say the lid was defective. Term of art, foreseeability, defective. This court decided the Stets case. I know it wasn't a 701 case. It was a Rule 56A-D case, but the, the daughter the slip and fall case, the daughter could say the steps were wet. The daughter could say she fell, but she couldn't say the steps, I fell because the steps were wet. Again, causation, legal conclusion, not based on personal observation. That same defect is the reason why the Penrose alleged testimony or alleged remarks is hearsay. Yes, she's an officer of the company, but the Bromwell case that we, that we cited, Granted, it's from the 8th District. The court said you not only have to have the authority to address, but it has to be a factual assertion based on personal knowledge. There's that concept again, personal knowledge. Um, it can't be a statement of opinion as to liability. I'll tell you, I've been doing this for 40 years. And this Whitney, at the time she testified, had been doing it for over 20 years. Experienced employment lawyers can't come up with a more conclusory allegation that would apply to this case than to say retaliatory or pretext, which is what I suspect happened here. But in any event, a legal conclusion cannot be an admission by a party op op opponent. Uh, Brahma case um, uh, from the 8th District the tree, a treating physician said that the other physician killed the, pain, the, the, the plaintiff. Inadmissible legal conclusion. The uh, Semco case, cited in the Bromo case, the copper was stolen. Legal conclusion, not based on personal observations. So whether it's under 701 or 801, the lack of any evidence that Joe Penrose's alleged testimony that was unlawful, based on unlawful workplace behaviors, et cetera, or retaliatory pretext is inadmissible under 701 and 801. After you take that out, they claim Mr. Smucker said at the termination meeting that Whitney was fired because of friction. We, we cite the entire passage at our brief on page nine. That's an obvious mischaracterization of the evidence. She said, Mr. Smucker said, the Jones Day thing was mo no small matter. Ms. Crean was terminated for behavioral issues. Unlike me, it was performance issues, but it was really limited to the Jones, not producing the summary to Jones Day. So there's no evidence of either direct, uh, either direct evidence of discrimination or to establish a uh, pretext. Um, there was a, uh, uh, an, an error, uh, another error in the trial court's uh, decision for finding that um, Jen Whitney engaged in protected activity during her August 6th discussion. Mr. Polk's words as he opened up was, it's a case about her complaining about unlawful practices, unlawful practices. Complaining about unlawful activity is not protected activity. As this court said in Pintagro and reaffirmed in Messer, the statute says it prohibits retaliation if you oppose an unlawful discriminatory practice, an unlawful discriminatory practice. So when Ms. Pintagro complained about a younger intern harassing him, the court, this court found 
You didn't say she was harassing you because of your age or sex. You just said he was harassing you. In Messer, she said she was uncomfortable changing in the unisex bathroom, but she didn't say why she was uncomfortable, so the court held that the manager who terminated her didn't know she had engaged in protected activity. She had engaged in protected activity with the team lead because she said, I am uncomfortable because, pardon the vernacular, but I don't want to see any male's butt and I don't want a, a, a male seeing my butt when I'm changing. Judge? Those, those cases are so fact specific. It's Sit, very sure. hard to just pull, you know, uh, a, a, like a rule of law out of them because obviously there were some judgment as well as like in the, in the case you're referring to, there was different facilities for her to change in. So she had other alternatives. Correct. So I guess this just seems like such a fact specific case that there's so much here and it just seems like, you know, by you looking at these cases and, and, and indicating, well, we said this in that case, we said this, it's all so fact specific is what I'm trying to say. So, and obviously we'll be looking at the, uh, the evidence with a fine tooth comb and going through it all. But I don't know that you can just look at a case and just extrapolate that case onto this one is what I'm trying to say. Fair enough, Judge, but most employment cases, as your honor knows, are quite fact specific. Let's look at the legal framework. The legal framework is the statute says it must be unlawful discriminatory conduct. There's been no there's no evidence produced that Jen Whitney told Mark Belger or Mark Smucker that Aaron Cream, Jeanette Knudsen, or as my late mother used to say, a man on the moon, would have um, um, engaged in discriminatory conduct, treating someone in a protected category or different because of their membership in a protected class. Uh, no allegation she said that. Moving on from the August uh, 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 6th, just saying unlawful, I think it was the NASIC case that we cited in our briefs from another district, where the... I will note that you're out of time, so if we can wrap up your answer to the question, please conclude. I will. Thank you, Judge. Um, whether the August 6th was, uh, um, um, the August 6th uh, interview, whether Jen Whitney engaged protected activity in that interview or not, doesn't need to be decided here because there's no evidence that could convince a rational jury that Mark Smucker, that the determining factor in her termination was not, as Mark Smucker said, the Jones Day report and findings standing alone. For that reason, summary judgment should be sustained. Thank you, Judge, for giving that Thank extra time. You'll have your full four minutes when you're ready. Thank you. I'm, I am ready. May I proceed? Okay. Um, as Judge Carr noted, this is a fact intense case, which is precisely the reason that summary judgment should not have been granted. Um, counsel mentioned the Pentagro case, which uh, I have the pleasure of being co counsel with one of the judges who decided that case. And it, stands for the unremarkable position that unless you engage in something that's protected activity, you don't have protections under the statute. That case was wildly different from this case. In this case, Jen Whitney engaged in a number of things which, according to what we've said in the record, their own lawyer, Shannon Shinneberry, readily concedes was protected activity. Mark Belgia concedes was her identifying uh, uh, issues about employment law and legal risk, right? The case law makes it very clear that you can object to things that are um, unlawful investigatory practices, unlawful discrimination. In this instance, Jen Whitney complained in detail to a number of people, including Mark Smucker, about those things. So it's unquestionably protected activity. As it relates to uh, the statements of Jill Penrose, Lindsay Tomaszewski, and Mark Smucker himself, uh, this, these, first of all, these comments are um, admissible as party admissions under Evidence Rule 801. But in addition to that, as uh, Mr. Weimer pointed out, they need to be based upon personal knowledge. And in the instance of Jill Penrose, for example, not only did she write an email to Mark Smucker objecting, not only did she participate in an interview with Jones Day, she received firsthand the complaints that Jen Whitney had raised. She sat with Jeanette Knudsen firsthand and communicated those concerns to her. She separately briefed Mark Smucker 
about the compliance legal claims that were going on, which resulted in Jeanette Knutson being so pissed off. So this is hardly a circumstance where she didn't have personal knowledge. And as it relates to her vernacular and her use of the terms retaliatory, talking about the reasons being nonsense, as well as the suggestion she should file a lawsuit, this woman is the highest ranking employee relations person in the entire Smucker Corporation. She is an officer of the company who has spent decades being trained specifically in employment law issues and human resources. So there's hardly somebody who is less or who is more qualified to be able to talk about what is or isn't retaliation, what is or isn't appropriate. But the counsel, you admit that those are legal conclusions. No, I, I, what I would suggest to you, Your Honor, is those are, those are no different than Your Honor having a conversation with somebody about a lawyer presenting during oral argument. That is a description of something that based upon your own personal experience as a professional in this industry can comment and detail what's happened different than the layperson. But that doesn't make it inadmissible. It is in fact based upon your own personal knowledge, first-hand experiences, and it does assist in an understanding of the witness's testimony. In addition to that, um, Smucker's entire defense hangs on the idea that it was Jones Day, not Jeanette Knutson, that motivated Mark Smucker's termination decision of Mark Whitney. Jones Day finished its reporting to Mark Smucker on September 11th, 2020. Nine days later, Mark Smucker still thought Jen Whitney should keep her job. How do we know this? Trial docket 128 at 14 to 20. Mark Smucker to Mark Belgium. Quote, I have done a lot of soul searching over the past several days and am questioning the decision to separate Jen Whitney. So I sat down today to do an analysis a decision analysis and a potential problem analysis. September 20, 2020, nine days after Jones Day was finished reporting, those documents contain a conclusion that Jen Whitney keep her job by a score of 327 to 318. Those documents also contain no reference to Jones Day whatsoever, no reference to withheld documents, no reference to losing faith as her as a lawyer. Instead, Mark Smucker notes at page 20 that if Whitney is not fired, an adverse consequence will be Jeanette Knutson departs the company. Why? Look at Mark Belge's response at 15 to 16. I'll note you're out of time if you would please briefly conclude. Yes, Your Honor. At page 15 and 16, Mark Belge knew about the details of the Jones Day investigation as well as Whitney claims. He also says nothing about Jones Day, nothing about withheld documents. He agrees that Jen Whitney should keep her job, but he reminds Mark Smucker in writing that if he doesn't fire Jen Whitney, he must be fully prepared to explain it to Knutson because Knutson wants her fired. This is cat's paw, this is causal connection, this is pretext, this is retaliation tied up in a bow. The case should be reversed and remanded for trial. Thank you. Thank you. So, can I address in 20 seconds? That whole last part was never argued. It, 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 it was not. Uh, um, it's, but it's actually in the briefs. It, it's not. It, 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 it's in the briefs. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's absolutely in the briefs. Thank you both for a presentation. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. The clerk of court will mail a copy of the decision that is made and entered, and the opinion will be released to the highest court. Supreme Court.